I'm Wilson Lai, and you're listening to Deep Cut. On Deep Cut, we compare director's most popular film with a personal favorite chosen by one of us. We also discuss that director's life and career to bring in context that helps us view their movies as they may want us to. So if you're enjoying the show, please remember to give us a rating or review and subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts. This will help others discover the show. You can also keep up with us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd at Deep Cut Pod. Um, If you want to talk about more movies with us or any other film, TV, please join us on our Discord server. If you're a big fan of the show, we have a Patreon if you want to help support us. You can click the link in our description or go to deepcutpod.com to find our Patreon, Discord, and all the other socials we've mentioned here. Today is going to be a very special episode of the podcast. I'm here with Ray Young, the director of this year's Berlinale premiering and Teddy Award winning All Shall Be Well. All Shall Be Well is about Angie, whose partner Pat unexpectedly passes away, leaving Angie with a flat that she comes to realize she has no legal right to. Pat's passing sees blood family dynamic shift and ultimately, in my opinion, proposes the necessity of a queer chosen family for LGBTQ folk in Hong Kong. Ray, Thank you so much for joining me today for this interview. I really loved your film, All Shall Be Well, and I'm so glad to see it doing really, really well in local cinemas. Hi, hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I just want to start at the beginning and before all your features were made, what got you into filmmaking in the first place? Well, actually, uh, even when I was a kid, I was always into uh, watching uh, TV and uh, movies. So... uh, Telling story was always uh, very uh, attractive to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, I didn't really know what a director is when I was at that age. But I think later on in life, then I realized that, oh, actually the actors don't think up those lines themselves. And there's a screenwriter and there is a director. And then uh, I start, you know, trying to research and sort of like, trying to get to know more about the industry and then realize that mm, this is something that I really wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. Can you cite any formative directors that you were discovering at that time mm. where you, when you were really getting into film in a serious kind of way? I think, uh, well, very, very early on, I used to like the Woody Allen movies. Mm-hmm. I thought they were very, very witty. I mean, considering that I was quite young at that time, I mean, yeah. I was... I think only like 13 or 14, but I don't know, somehow I always find that, well, maybe I've got very sophisticated taste that I'm <laughs> going to think of. You really it. could, yeah. Being that young, and actually, you know, watching like Manhattan and all that, I thought it was something different. It wasn't just about telling a, a, a story with mm-hmm. a plot, but actually about people. Yeah. About uh, characters, mm-hmm. and they are not perfect. You know, like when you're growing up, like you know, watching a lot like hero movies or you know fairy tales. In many yeah. ways, is that the protagonist has to be this hero, has to be perfect. But you know, the Woody Allen's movies are not. They yeah. are all full of a uh, neurosis, and mm-hmm. they are they are stuck a lot of the times. Yeah, very uh, true. They can't they can't move on because of their own hangups. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, these are very very interesting. And at that time, I'd never been to New York. I didn't yeah. even know what New York is like. <laughs> but watching that, I just find it fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting because I can see a sort of like naturalism to the dialogue in Woody Allen's films that you sort of replicate in your film set in Hong Kong. Um, so I think maybe that could be like a through line in your in your filmmaking. Yeah. And then later on, I think because like I then I, I went on and studied law and all that and then had a different career. But mm-hmm. I think later on, I watched... Um, Almodova, the movie oh. called uh, Woman on the Verge. Of a Nervous Breakdown. Yeah, yeah, and I thought, wow, that was very uh, interesting to me because I felt it's just about a bunch of misfits, really. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird, awkward, strange people with this passion and and the way that the story is being told is so different and, and the color, uh, the art direction, everything was very new. Mm-hmm. And I thought, oh, this is really something that I want to get involved in. 
Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it was Almodovar that one of, was one of the forces that got you to finally get professionally into filmmaking. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. Do you think that, I guess, the queer nature of his filmmaking spoke to you? Yes, I think it's the aesthetic because, like, his work is not always about gay characters. Yes. You know, it's not, you know, strictly speaking, you can't really, like, label it as an LGBT movie. Right. Because a lot of the times the protagonists are women mm-hmm. and, and the storyline are heterosexual. is about the woman falling in love with maybe a playboy or something like that. Yeah. Uh, or, or they have some kind of uh, relationships that is slightly extraordinary, something mm-hmm. like that. So it's not exactly always about gay characters, but on the side, they always have characters that are strange or weird yes. in the mainstream world, you know, like uh, a trans or someone who is uh, a nun, but is into piss or something like that, right? <laughs> right. Very bizarre. And you think, why not? Why can't movies uh, embrace these things? It's a... Uh, human nature there are all kinds of people we all have different kind of uh, obsessions yeah uh, or secrets but he was able to lay that all out have a laugh at it taking the seriousness or the naughtiness or the um somehow uh, make it seems that is fun and mm-hmm. vibrant uh, not something that you should judge yeah. so i thought all that is uh, very attractive to me that's great yeah that's great so Making the jump from law to filmmaking, could you explain how that came about? Like, I am assuming that you grew up in Hong Kong, right? And I grew up in Hong Kong. I have Asian parents. And it's that classic thing of like, oh, we want you to have a job in a field that will make you a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I I left very early. I Mm -hmm. left Hong Kong at 13. Wow. But I, because from 13 onwards, I was really in boarding school. So I actually had a quite a separate lives from my parents already. Mm-hmm. Of course, I would come back in the, you know, holidays and then we will sort of like uh, get together. But I wasn't living with them from 13 onwards, really. Yeah. So I very much already had a very independent identity. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course, you know, because they really wanted me to do law. And at that time, although I, want, I knew what I wanted to do, I didn't know how to get into the industry because um, in the West, it didn't seem that there were any Asian representations at all. So for didn't yeah. seem like that is an opportunity for an Asian boy to get into a British film industry. It just yeah. felt so far, far away. And then the Hong Kong industry was had a bad reputation, to be honest, at that time, because it always felt that there was a a lot of um, gangsters were running it or right. um well anyway something that has a very um scary image mm-hmm. you know and also to be honest the movies that they were making wasn't movies that i wanted to watch you know as i as i quoted you know yes. Almodovar, <laughs> woody allen and they were showing gangsters movies right. and you know and slapstick comedies like yeah. the chinese new year movies that i've never watched i've never even seen one up to today <laughs> so i've seen clips Probably of for them. the best for the best <laughs> <laughs> i've seen clips of them i i, I it's not my sense of humor so i didn't really get it yeah so i think i think um that's why at that point i didn't really know how to get into the industry so that's why i did law and uh but later on as i said uh things start changing and then you can see that well another movie that really influenced me was watching um on these wedding banquet oh that's great because um for the first time i realized that oh okay People are interested in a story about a uh, Chinese mm-hmm. and also um, they, their issues. Yeah. And, uh, and it can be modern. It can be funny. It doesn't have to be all that, you know, sort of like traditional or Kung Fu or anything like that. Right. So therefore, that was another movie. I thought, mm, well, if they are interested in this movie, maybe I can tell my story yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting because another director we've had on the podcast as for an interview was Andrew Ahn. Mm-hmm. And Andrew also said that The Wedding Banquet was really formative for him. Yeah. And now he's like making the remake of it right I now. Know. It's yes. kind of crazy. So, yeah, you were talking about like local Hong Kong cinema. So I guess you weren't really consuming that at the time when you were growing up. But I was wondering now 
you're more established, you have seen more of like Hong Kong cinema, the popular stuff, but also the more tour driven stuff. Mm. Like I could think of some queer directors like Stanley Kwan. Mm. Do you think that that has also informed your work and the way you make your movies? Yes. I mean, um, I mean, I, I said that I didn't watch a lot of those Hong Kong movies. Yeah. Of course, there were a lot of Hong Kong movies that I did watch as well. Yeah. I mean, like Anne Ho. Yeah. I, I have watched every single one of her movies. Um, What's your favorite Anne Ho movie? The Way We Are. Oh, the one in Tin, the one that's set yeah. in Tin Sai Wai. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really I think great. that is that is my favorite because mm-hmm. um, the film is so, it's about nothing, but it's about everything. Yeah. doesn't really have a plot, but it has a lot of... Uh, hearts in it so mm-hmm. i thought that was a, a and also a very interesting way of storytelling uh of course you know uh stanley kwan i love uh the actress yeah. and also a rouge yeah the one with anita mui uh wong kar wai was mm-hmm. a big influence um so yeah i also watch a lot of uh, hong kong movies as well right is front cover your feature debut uh no i actually uh made a movie called Cut Sleep Boys. Okay. Uh, that is when I was uh, still uh, in the law profession. I um, wanted to get out of it and I wasn't sure whether I was able to make it as a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. So uh, I basically uh, wrote a script, got a bunch of friends together and uh, shot it. Wow. On a very, very low budget. Um, but we were very, very lucky because uh, I was in London at the time and we couldn't find a producer. And <laughs> at that time, I didn't even know you needed a producer. But as, as, as we were preparing, we realized that we needed a producer and we didn't know where to find one. Uh, so we went online, I did, I did, I didn't met a few people that didn't work out. And then, this is an interesting story, is that my one of the actors... Uh, in the film, I knew, said, oh, I actually, someone next door to me works at the BBC. <laughs> Maybe we should talk to them. So wow. I said, oh, well, why not, right? We were so, so desperate at that point. And so we went to talk to them. And then they introduced me to this woman uh, who works at the BBC as a producer. Mm-hmm. And she said, oh, okay, I'm actually about to leave the BBC. I want to do it on my own. So maybe this is an interesting project for me to start trying to do an indie movie. Wow. So she read the script and she thought, wow, this sounds interesting, something different. So she came on board and just put everything together for us, including her, at that time she had a boyfriend who was a DP. Yeah. And who's very established as well. So uh, she got him to shoot it for us. Wow. Yeah, so, so, so it's one of those situations that, you know, you had a dream and then you start trying, pursuing it without knowing how. Sometimes things work out because mm-hmm. uh, people see how passionate you are and people see that you are working hard and yeah. they will want to help. Wow. Yeah. That's a fantastic story. <laughs> Where would you be without that producer? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And the, and the film did uh, reasonably well because mm-hmm. then uh, we were, it went to Frameline and went to Outfest and we won Best Feature at Outfest Fusion. Wow. And I got a sales agent and everything and something that was launched into this world that I was a proper filmmaker. Yeah. So I was, uh, I was quite, 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 um, yeah, quite lucky. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that immediately happens. And like, when do you start getting a desire to return to Hong Kong to make movies? Because I know there's another feature that you'd shot in the US, right? Like yes. after this. Yeah. So after that, then I came back to Hong Kong and then I uh, wanted to change career. At that time, I still wasn't sure I want to go into the Hong Kong film industry. Right. So I, I did change career and I started doing advertising because I mm-hmm. thought that is something that is close to it, but mm-hmm. not having to you know, get into the industry. And I didn't really know how to get into the industry at that point. So I just basically wrote to a, a production house and then they interviewed me and then I got the job. And then I started working in advertising and I realized that, oh, okay, yes, this is good, but it's still not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm still not really telling my stories. I'm surfacing, uh, you know, selling a product. Yeah. Fun that it was, it was very fun. And I really enjoyed it. I met a lot of good people and learned a lot about shooting, but it still wasn't what I wanted to do. So then I went to Columbia. I really decided to, I need to study this. So I went to uh, do an MFA at uh, Columbia. Oh, the writing and directing track. Yes, yes. Okay, sweet. Yeah. I have some friends that are doing that 
Exactly right now. Right. Because yeah. you went to where, sorry? I went to Wesleyan. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's undergrad, right? Undergrad. Yeah. Um, and I had films in, uh, friends in the film studies major that after graduating maybe took a year or maybe didn't take that much longer and then immediately started the MFA program. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Maybe, mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, it really helps. I think it really helped me anyway, at least right. because um, particularly the first year, it was very, very tough. And uh, it was difficult to get into because in order to get into, you have to write three or four pieces and wow. uh, send it to them. And then they choose and decide. Feature piece, feature scripts. No, one at that time, one was uh, they, they gave you a few lines and then you have from this few lines, you have to write a story. Mm-hmm. Something like that, exercises, right. you know, writing exercises, right. you know. And while you were there, did you feel like the environment around you fostered a real sense of like, I want to become a filmmaker. Like this is the world that I want to. Yeah. Because everybody there were very passionate, Mm -hmm. you know, from the teachers to the students and they are very international, which was great because you're not getting just from one point of view, uh, basically, you know, say American independent or Hollywood, but everything, you know, from people all over the world, you know, South America, uh, Africa, Scandinavia. So you are really open up mm-hmm. to a different world with different people and they all have different tastes and knowledges. So it was a fantastic experience. Yeah. Wow. That's really awesome. So you make front cover while you're in um, yes. Colombia? Yes. Yeah. So what happened was that the course is three to five years, yeah. the MA, MFA. And uh you have to hand in your thesis and mm-hmm. then you can graduate. Yeah. So I already finished my thesis on the third year, Yeah. but I continued to stay. And then for the last two years, I basically made my feature while I was there. Wow. But we still have to pay, but um, I think it was a, a, a certain percentage, not the full okay. tutorial fees, and, but the teachers still need to entertain you. <laughs> <laughs> and... and uh, and you still can use the facilities. Okay, so that includes like equipment and yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. Or because because I was also working with the undergrad students on my film, so mm-hmm. they were able to get more equipments because they are the, you know, they are under. They still haven't done their thesis, right? So right. they were able to get the full set of equipments. Well, because I already done my thesis, I could yeah. only take a certain you know amount of the. The, the equipment's out. So because they were working for me as my, say, production manager, so they can yeah. book rooms, wow. rehearsal rooms. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very good choice. Did you have it all planned out? You were like, okay, I'm going to finish my thesis in the third year, and then I'm going to make this feature that I have in my head. During my second year, yes. I think mm-hmm. during my second year, I towards the second year, uh, I wasn't the only one who was doing it that way. Other people were doing it that way too. Mm-hmm. So I just knew that, well, if... If who and who have done it already and shot a feature while he was at Columbia, why couldn't I? Yeah. But people at NYU do it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. In NYU used to be forever. You can stay forever as long as you don't hand in your thesis. You can <laughs> stay forever. And that's what a lot of people uh, make their features that way. I think wow. now, of course, you can't. But I'm talking about like I was t- heard stories, you know, like Spike Lee and all that in that era. Yes. They just never graduated. They just make after they make two features, they won whatever awards, you know, the Sundance Award, then they go back and pay off their <laughs> <laughs> student, student, student loans. loans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So after Front Cover, did you feel like Hong Kong was calling you? Okay, so after I graduated, eventually, I already made front cover. And by then, I already made two features in English. Yes. So I thought, well, I should really uh, do a Cantonese movie yeah. because I'm from here. And, and Cantonese is my first language. Mm-hmm. But I can't write. Mm-hmm. I can't write Chinese because I went to international school. So um, I can read. Yeah. But I can I can write a little bit not well enough to write a script. That's for yeah. sure. But that was, that was something that always stopping me. So eventually I thought, well, I should do it anyway. So I came back and then um, I found a topic that I wanted to write, which is uh, End Up Being Sok Sok. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I found this book called The Oral Histories of Older Gay Men in Hong Kong. Wow. And uh, that book inspired me to write a script 
in English, mm-hmm. and then afterwards, then I get someone to translate it to Chinese. So that's how I did it, and that became my first、uh, Chinese movie. <laughs> that's incredible. I am also.、Uh... Guilty of being an international school student、yeah. that did not、um, learn enough Chinese in time、um, to become an adult. <laughs> yeah, I think Suk Suk is such a brilliant film because it not only showcases like gay culture in Hong Kong, but also like older gay culture in Hong、mm. Kong, which is something that is like marginalized. Section of a marginalized folk,、yeah. and it was truly incredible to see you shine a light on that, and also make it a very tender story. Where I think, like coming out in society in Hong Kong, feels a lot harder to do here than it is in the West. Like、mm. I feel like it's not the norm here.、Mm. Yeah.、Mm-hmm. Well, especially from that era. Yes, because the two、uh, characters in the film、uh, they are already in their sixties.、Mm-hmm. So we are talking about the time that when they were sort of realizing that they were gay, it was in the seventies in Hong Kong, and at that time Hong Kong was very very、uh, conservative. Yeah, and so、um, it was very very difficult.、Uh, particularly, they are from of a certain class,、mm-hmm. uh, not very well educated, wasn't really exposed to、uh, any sort of like LGBTQ. Politics or anything like that,、yeah. and so it was very much、um, see homosexuality as something that is a disease. Right. So for them to come out would be very difficult, and don't forget that it was illegal in Hong Kong at the time.、Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, it was a crime. Yeah. So therefore, for、uh, for them to come out was very very difficult. So the story is based on these two characters who carry all these baggages with them,、uh, growing up in Hong Kong in、uh, that era, and they got married. Pat, the main character, didn't really truly identify himself as gay.、Mm-hmm. Uh, he just felt that he was、uh, straight, but only had this、uh, strange desire to sleep with men occasionally. Mm-hmm. And then the other character Hoi、uh, knows that he's gay,、uh, but had to get married in order to、uh, comply with the、uh, society's requirements, and then divorce his wife and、uh, bring up his son、uh, by himself, a single father. So it's about these two men falling in love. Yeah, yeah, it's truly beautiful. Like, Thanks. And I think it you can really see it in conversation with All Shall Be Well, where. You have at least in the the beginning of All Shall Be Well. You have a really, like, I would say, like outwardly affectionate and accepted、um, lesbian couple in maybe that similar age range、um, that are like that is going about their day and they're preparing for Zhong Chao Di like dinner with their family who all comes and it seems like on the surface. Very accepting and very loving, which immediately already struck me before I knew what happened afterwards. I was like, "Wow! Like this really warms my heart. Like it's it's good to see this." Right. Right. Yeah. But how do you feel? How do you see these two films talking to each other? Well, I think in a way, it's a little bit like a continuation because, like with Sook Sook, at the end, right? What Pat and Hoi wanted is that perfect relationship where Angie and Pat. Yes, you know, have so so in 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 so so the two of them couldn't get together, but their ut- utopia would be this. Yes, in the beginning of all shall be well. So in a way, in that sense, it's a continuation. So if what if Pat and Hoy did come out and was able to live together, and their families are very open and acceptance, then that will be the beginning of all shall be well. But then we see that is that acceptance. Really, really deep down,、mm-hmm. is it really something that the family or the society truly embrace the、mm-hmm. LGBTQ community? Yeah, and as you can see in the movie, all shall be well. That it quickly changed. Yeah, what seems to be on the surface as acceptance, perhaps it was just something that is only skin deep. Yeah, as soon as something change, then um the whole thing will you know become something different. Yeah, yeah. It 
was really it was heartbreaking yeah. <laughs> like i i cried many times in that <laughs> film um, oh, and that you. just speaks to the power of the filmmaking honestly oh thank you thank you I, I i think also because the film is in that sense that it shows that for the lgbtq community in hong kong coming out is only a first step mm -hmm. yes it's difficult but once even if you have done that even you have find your true love you still have all these issues, all these problems that you have to face yeah. uh, that we don't actually know mm -hmm. or movies very rarely show. Yeah. You know, it's always about coming out, acceptance of yourself and about uh, uh, talking to your families and whether your families accept you and all that. But actually, even you have achieved all that, there's still a whole lots of things that you have to face. Yeah, yeah. And I think... You do this really, really well, but I think it adds to how bad you feel in the film is like you really make a case for Pat's family, mm -hmm. like Pat's brother, uh, Pat's niece and nephew are not as well off as Pat and Angie. And mm -hmm. it's very clear that Pat and Angie have done well in their life that they could have afforded this apartment. And when you show where her brother lives, um, where he has to work the night guard sh shift like you as someone who like lives in Hong Kong you understand that these are two separate classes mm -hmm. and I think you do a really incredible job of doing this balancing act of showing pathos for Angie but also explaining why the apartment is important mm -hmm. to Pat's blood family mm -hmm. Why did you decide to go about it like mm, this? Mm, yeah, because I I didn't really want the audience to immediately... If, if I had portrayed the family members immediately and greedy, they just mm -hmm. wanted to grab the apartment from Angie. I think most of the audience, when they watch it, they will go, hmm, those are baddies. Yeah. So they will be like watching Star Wars, where there is the hero, the protagonist, and then there's the villains, the baddies. So they will automatically identify with the hero. Right. And then distance themselves from the villains. Mm -hmm. I don't want the audience to do that. I want the audience to be able to empathize with these uh, family members, understand why they need this apartment, and then question themselves and say, okay, if I also need this apartment myself, and suddenly I got this opportunity to own this apartment, will I let this woman stay there? Even though I know that this woman have lived there all these years and is my aunt's uh, life partner, but now that the law is on my side and legally she has no ground to stand on, therefore, uh, why not? Why shouldn't I serve myself? Yeah. So I want the audience to have those questions in their mind so that they can see or explore what is the true meaning of families and also um, how homophobia they are, yeah. how much they really accept uh, LGBTQ community. Do they really see that they should have equal rights? Mm -hmm. I think I think that is something that uh, I want the audience to uh, think about. Yeah, like putting themselves in the shoes. Of yeah, the yeah. Because otherwise, if they don't empathize with their family members, they don't see why uh, they needed the apartment, then they just feel that they are just greedy, mm -hmm. and uh, then they would be very distant from the from the actual point that I was trying to make. Right. Yeah. yeah. And you show different layers of acceptance as well in your film, like Angie's parents are not even like accepting on that baseline level. And then you have Pat's brother and sister-in-law who are accepting when Pat's alive, but become greedy really fast. Mm. But then you have the younger generation who tries their best within reason, tries their best to help Angie out. But in the end, they were the actual ones or the nephew was the one that really benefits from from this apartment. So I think it's it's really great that you you used a big umbrella of of different attitudes towards LGBTQ people to to examine. Yeah, I think I think it also explore not just legally uh, mm -hmm. how the uh, LGBTQ community in Hong Kong has no rights. Uh, but also it's not just the law, but the society, the culture is also very homophobic. As in the movie, you can see in the scene where Angie had to do this ritual to honor Pat. And because the, this kind of rituals uh, 
Mm-hmm. They always place the importance on the male, the yeah. male heir, or who is the head of the family. So all that, and if you are a woman, you are put on the side. And if you are in the LGBT community, you are not even addressed because they didn't have those things in those days. Yeah, and yet this ritualistic thing that has passed on to us, even today in Hong Kong, I think a lot of people uh, still follow it. Yeah. Uh, especially in uh, in the funerals, right, or that kind of anything to do with death. I think because death is so scary, mm-hmm. and people just didn't want to do anything that might upset the spirit, yes. quote to go. So <laughs> therefore, they will comply with any nonsense mm-hmm. that whatever the uh, traditional beliefs told them to do. Yeah. So I think that is also part of the uh, situations that I want to reflect. Yeah, yeah. What was your inspiration for this because it feels like it's more targeted than Suk Suk. Like you're really trying to say something about maybe the legal framework or how society treats um, LGBTQ folk in Hong Kong, like in a more targeted kind of way. Yeah, in uh, in 2020, when uh, Suk Suk was released around that time in Hong Kong, I went to a talk about um, the Hong Kong LGBTQ communities that inheritance rights Mm -hmm. and during that talk the speaker uh, quoted three cases uh, very similar to the storyline of all shall be well about Mm -hmm. a long-term couple one pass away and the other one have to struggle with the family members over the estate Uh, so i thought "Mm, this is an interesting story so i asked the speaker to introduce me to those cases the Mm -hmm. people involved and interview them Mm -hmm. and then decided to write a script about it Wow. Yeah, so so that's why it came from real life situations, yeah. uh, interview with people. But in the real world, those few cases that I interview, the family members turn very, very quickly mm. and much more nasty. Almost immediately in one case that wow. two hours later after the partner passed away, they already said to her, oh, where are all her watches? Uh, we wanted to her to wear a nice watch at the funeral. Can you bring all her watches back? Oh and they gosh. never returned them. So uh, I didn't want the story to be like that, uh, like I said, because otherwise it would be very clear that there's a villain uh, in the film. Uh, so I uh, mellow it down, actually. Yeah. Wow. So it's not even like it is a very realistic um, portrayal, but it's actually, yeah, even more toned down than what happened in yeah, real life. Yeah. Yeah. In real life, it's much more horrific because in one case, uh, they uh, move in and change the lock. Wow. So that the, the, the woman couldn't get back in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You have a few actors in this, like Patra Ao and Toy Bo, that you've worked with in Suk Suk and then sort of cast them in very different roles in this. Had, had anything like shifted? Like how did you choose these actors for the role and what was it like working with them in this in this film compared to Suk Suk? Well, uh, with uh, Tai Bo, of course, I had a, a very good relationship working with him and Petra mm-hmm. as well on Suk Suk. Uh, so I wanted to work with them again anyway. Yeah. And as I said, 2020 was the time that uh, I started having the idea for this uh, script. So, and also at the same time, uh, Suk Suk was being released. Yeah. So I was uh, hanging out with them a lot, you know, doing a lot of uh, Q&As and mm-hmm. going to uh, events with them. So uh, particularly for Petra, uh, I thought that she uh, in real life has uh, some characters that's very similar to uh, the Angie that I wanted. Okay. Uh, I wanted Angie to be very feminine on the outside, but actually is very strong and resilient inside. Mm -hmm. And Petra in real life has that quality. So uh, when I was writing very much, I was kind of slightly uh, portrayed um, Petra playing Angie already. Wow. With Taibo, uh, it was later on when the script was finished and I was thinking, mm, who could play this particular character? And yeah. I thought uh, Taibo would be a good fit. And also because we, we, when we worked together last time, so, so, um, I thought they did a wonderful job. Yeah, I think so, so too. Um, therefore, I'm, and I know both of them are, have a big range mm-hmm. and they can do something very different. Uh, yeah. from the characters that they were portraying in Sok Sok. So uh, therefore I approached them. 
That's really great. You're sort of building, like, in the classic way that people view auteurs, you're sort of building a troupe of actors that you can return to in your following well, movies. Yeah, but actually the crew, even more so. All my producers mm. are the same. Uh, same DP, same production designer, yeah. uh, same production manager. So, yeah, very, <laughs> very much. But also because... Um, it's only my second film, so I still yeah. don't know a lot of people in Hong Kong. Yeah. Um, so and don't forget that during that period was COVID as well. Yeah. So we were all locked up at home. So if maybe there would have been more opportunities for me to go and meet more people, but mm -hmm. I was not able to. Yeah. But having said that, of course, I was very very happy with the team that I have anyway. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So the it was the a, film really has such a unique sensibility when you consider it in contrast to a lot of. Hong Kong films, like even the indie Hong Kong films, I think your films flow like in the way that the dialogue flows, in the way that you edit, in the way that Lo Ming Kai shoots it, it feels very special and unique and down to earth. Oh, right? thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, one of the reasons the pacing, mm -hmm. I, th I think a lot of the Hong Kong uh, movies, uh, the pacing is quite fast. Yeah. And also um, they need to have a lot of plot lines. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, we try to uh, not let that style, you know, we, we try to do something that's different from that style. I yeah. think that's our aim. Is, is editing a long process for you when you go into, when you finish shooting? For Sook so it was very long because it took us months to, to cut it together. And I, I usually show it to people as I cut. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, have a version that I think I'm quite happy with. Uh, let me invite the people to come to watch them. So yeah. we already did that four or five times. So, so, so that was over a few months already. And in the end, I was very happy with the cut. And then I finally invited Stanley Kwan, wow. the filmmaker, to, to come and watch it because I think this is the last one. So let me call <laughs> the big shot yes, to yes. come and see it. So he said, uh, okay, but uh, can I bring a friend? I said, sure, sure, of course. And of course, the friend turned out to be William Jung. Oh my gosh. Yes, uh, Wong the Kar Wai's. Yeah, the infamous uh, Wong Kar Wai's uh, editor and production designer. Mm -hmm. So I was like, wow, my God, I'm sweating. <laughs> I mean, those are the longest uh, 100 minutes in my life, I think, as they were watching the film. I was thinking, oh, my God, they're going to, you know, so I think, what the hell is this guy doing? Why <laughs> does he want to make this movie? He doesn't know how to make movies at all. So anyway, after the screening, silence, I was thinking, mm, okay, what should we do? And then he said, oh, let's go and have coffee. So okay. I said, okay, great. <laughs> And of course, there was no coffee shops at the editing suite where we were. We was in uh, uh, Kalun Bay. Okay. So they said, oh, let's go to uh, Causeway Bay. That journey fell forever, of course. <laughs> <laughs> because no one wants to talk about the film like things after they sat down and ordered a cup of coffee. Yeah. But so that journey was like, we tried to talk this, tried to talk that, but not talk about the film. Eventually, when they sat down, then uh, William had a lot of... Uh, ideas and opinions okay. he said oh in that in that scene why don't we do it this way why don't you try to do it that way why don't you try to do it this way mm. so i sort of like well okay in that case if you have so many opinions why don't you cut it <laughs> <laughs> and then he said okay wow i was like hold on did you say okay <laughs> <laughs> he said yeah yeah okay i'll cut it I, okay, all right. So, um, yeah, so that was amazing. It was yeah. really, really, truly, um, yeah, a, a I amazing was literally, experience. Yeah. I was literally going to ask about William Chat, like how you got in touch with him, but that's an incredible story. Yeah, 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 yeah. So he started cutting it, and then, um, yeah, so he made some changes. Mm -hmm. um, not a whole lot in terms of the structure, but what he did was that he was really able to... Uh, change some of the shots and tell emotions visually. Okay. It's the knack that he knows how to do it. It's just moving some things can lead the audience to a, a point where they will understand what the protagonist is going through without having dialogues. Wow. Yeah. So do you have an example, like a example of that in Suk Suk? Mm, in Suk Suk, I think one of the moments was when Pat goes into the church at the very last scene mm -hmm. and then he sat down and then he has this uh, 
flashback yeah. of moments of the relationship with Hoy. Yeah. And then he just uses a lot of sort of like um, still shots, mm. like a montage. Yeah. And then immediately the way that he arranged it make you understand that what Pat was going through, mm -hmm. sad, but also at the same time, he's happy in the sense that he had this experience in his life. Yeah. For the very first time, he fell in love with a man mm -hmm. and really truly know what uh, love is. Yeah. So I think, I think, I think all that was, a he was able to do it without having, you know, some, like some dialogue or some big scenes, you know, it's yeah. ac actually very, very subtle, very, very simple because all it, the simplest way to tell an emotion is the best rather yeah. than you created a whole big scene yeah. uh, to say something uh, too elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was something that uh, he did, which I thought was wonderful. That's great. Yeah. So did this working relationship continued into All Shall Be Well, but was he a little more involved in the edit when you were doing All Shall Be Well? He didn't read the script or anything. I think I, I, I shot everything and then I just gave it to him. Wow. And then he started uh, cutting okay. it. But I also cut my own version. Mm. I always do. Mm -hmm. And then we compare. Mm -hmm. And then we bargain. Okay. <laughs> what, is that, what is that conversation like? It's, it's, no, he, he's, he's very good. He will, uh, he will then watch my, my, my cut while I watch his cut. And then we will sit down and compare notes a little bit and then he will do a cut on my cut and I'll do a cut on his cut okay and then we will start exchanging notes that way mm -hmm. and then in the end but then the, the, at that point we do it separately we still do it separately everything yeah. was through emails right. or through the editors and then until uh very near the very end mm -hmm. then we will sit together and actually discuss shot by shot why we want it this way and why he doesn't like it that way or why he wants to put that in and why I feel that it shouldn't be in there. So we will have that conversation and yeah. then um, co collaborate in that way. That's really great because it sort of reinforces your intentionality as a director. Be yeah. Like I am making this choice, like, and I can back, I can explain why I made this yes, choice. Yes, yes. But also it's very good because I, I always feel that, uh, Especially if, if you're a screenwriter and director, you really ought to get another editor to come in. Because mm. if you also edit yourself, it's too too much in your head already. You mm. a lot of the times you feel that you the audience understand what is going on, but actually because you are already with that project for three years, yeah. you assume everything is very clear. Yeah. But actually it's not. You need a, a very someone like a clear third pair of eyes to come and look at it and kind of look at it and go, no, actually, uh, this is not clear or mm -hmm. this is not conveying what you think it is conveying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. When you were talking about the ending of Sok Sok, it reminded me of the ending of All Shall Be Well, that flashback, that final scene. I have my ideas about why that scene but I wanted to ask you why you chose for oh, that scene oh, what, to be. What, 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 what is your take on it? Well, I think that it is her reminiscing on the good times that she had. And I think, like, it was not... I think choosing a small moment instead of a big romantic gesture makes it even more heart-wrenching mm -hmm. because the... Pat was Angie's family and Pat was someone that really understood her and understood the whole like family of it all. Mm -hmm. And I think closing out on that note makes you think about what was lost, but also think about how beautiful that connection was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I'm on the mark or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's a, a movie out there. I think every audience should be able to bring their own interpretation, particularly mm -hmm. the last part of the movie. I leave it uh, quite open. Yeah. Because I think, I think, especially the ending, the audience should really bring in their own emotion, their own understanding, their own experience of understanding things and make it their own. Right. Make the ending their own ending. Yeah. Uh, so some people will see it as a very happy ending because yeah. uh, Angie is able to move on. And some people will feel it it's a very sad ending because yeah. she lost everything. And I think all of them are fine because yeah. I think a, a movie that's for adults, 
not porn. Yeah. Like, <laughs> adults, you know, mature people uh, should have that kind of uh, uh, feelings where the audience can all have their own take on it. Yeah. Uh, rather than spoon feeding you, this is this 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 happening. This happy ending. There you go. Yeah. You know, I think that is like a fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, the choice to not show the legal battle and just have Angie make the choice to to go forward with the legal and then show the aftermath of it when they're scattering the um, the flowers. I, I think, yeah, it's it's a choice that not a con- a conventional director would not make. Yeah. Um, did you even write anything? Within that legal battle? No. Okay. No, not really. No. Uh, yeah, so somebody watched my film and said that, oh my God, you took out all the dramatic parts <laughs> from this story, like the death. You yeah. don't show the death. Yeah. And you don't show the fight. You don't show the legal battle. It's yeah. like you've taken everything out and then you just mess the rest. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, 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 think, I think it's far more interesting. I mean, let's face it, we watch enough movies about death and then the legal battle. I, I mean, all those, we watch it on television all the time, yeah. you know, and we don't really need to see them again because there's nothing that is going to be that new that come out of it. But what is important is how that affect those people mm-hmm. around it. I think those are much more uh, uh, touching mm-hmm. or much more uh, relatable yeah. than a courtroom drama. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, when, I was ex- when I was introducing the film, I talked about this sort of chosen family. Like mm-hmm. Angie has a chosen, or Angie and Pat had a chosen family with the other lesbian couples they hung out with. And they were, at the end of the film, they're truly the ones that are there for Angie and hold her up and support her, whether it's legally, socially, financially, like they are there for her. Could you talk about this idea to include them as a really big force in the film mm, mm. actually it's quite interesting it's um originally when i wrote the script angie has a one good friend uh, she's a heterosexual woman with mm-hmm. a husband uh and her name is lynn so uh, after i wrote that uh i did a uh, uh, table reads i also do table reads and invite people to come to the table reads and listen to the story mm-hmm. and then give their opinions and because uh, I, I'm, I'm a man and the protagonist is a woman a particular lesbian woman i was very very worried about uh, not writing a very authentic character mm-hmm. so uh, i make sure that uh, first of all uh, i was collaborating with uh, Dennis tan who is a professor at the uh, nanham university mm-hmm. and she is actually at that time writing a book about uh, older lesbians in asia mm-hmm. so she was able to introduce me to a lot of uh, older lesbians uh, based in hong kong so I invited them to come to the table read. And then afterwards, uh, the one big changes that I made was coming from them is that they said that it's very rare for a woman, a lesbian at that age, that has no a group of lesbian friends supporting her. Mm. They said because uh, when they were young, in order not to get married and be single and go and live with a woman, you pretty much uh, likely would be rejected by your families and your society. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you really need a very, very strong uh, network of people to support you. Mm -hmm. And therefore, a lot of lesbians of that age group in Hong Kong will have a very, very tight-knit lesbian friends around them, a social group. So they said, uh, otherwise, it will not be realistic. Mm. So um, so that's why I start making the changes. So it became from a one heterosexual woman, best mm-hmm. friend. Was she a lawyer as well? No, or no. She friend? was uh, uh, still works in a, uh, uh, she's still a florist. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with a husband. But so I changed that to the lesbian uh, couple. Mm-hmm. And then later on with a bunch of friends, yeah. This feels like a big change that, that yes, really affects yes, the, yes. But the I way think the film for the better because yes. now a lot of people from the LGBTQ community, particularly those older lesbians who came to watch it, they felt the story is uh, authentic. Yeah, which is very very important to me. Yeah, that's great. Now, well, let's talk about the reception this movie has had in Hong Kong because mm. it 
has been doing very well in the box office. Congratulations oh, on all you, the box you. office success. And I know you've been doing a lot of in-person Q&As, and I'm sure you're talking to a lot of audiences of the film. And I'm, I was wondering if there was anything that struck you about the way the film has been received, whether it's been with like queer audiences or straight audiences. How has the film been received for you? I think in general, very good, particularly the critics has all embraced it. So mm-hmm. I think that that really helps. Uh, and the word of mouth has been good. Um, mm-hmm. I think more touching for me is that uh, one particular screening, uh, when I came out, a woman came up to me um, crying and saying that she, for 30 years, had been waiting for this movie to happen. Wow. She said she uh, never thought that uh, her life, her story could be told on screen. Mm-hmm. Particularly, she said that the opening scene of the Pat and Angie together shopping, she said that's exactly like what her life is like. And she was very um, shocked to see the same thing, you know, being shown on screen. And on top of that, that nobody in the audience Mm -hmm. uh, start calling names or anything. Everybody seems to embrace it. She said for her, that was something that was uh, very significant. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was very touching. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. So just a couple more questions. So the podcast, as you know, is we pick a deep cut film from a director. So are there any directors or lesser known directors or lesser known films, in your opinion, that you think people should know about or check out? Maybe in relation to All Shall Be Well, but it doesn't have to be. Right. It's just yeah, sort of free reign. Choose a movie that people should watch or a director. I think I can't remember exactly the name. It's a funeral parade of roses. Yeah, Have yeah, you yeah. Seen the that Japanese, movie? Yes, yes, a Japanese movie. It was so wacky. Yeah, that movie. I think it was set in the sixties, mm-hmm. right? In 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 Japan. Yes, and it's about this bunch of. Oh, were they trans or cross dressers yeah, or, yeah. or something? They... But it was two rival gangs, and mm-hmm. one just wear kimonos, and the other gang wear modern clothes, <laughs> and they have this rivalry. But it's like so wacky the whole film, right? And also, it, it breaks a lot of the traditional classic Hollywood style of filmmaking mm-hmm. or film language. Yeah, uh, it just suddenly break out and it become they have this LSD experience yes. yeah. or something like that. And for me, I thought. Well, why not, right? Mm-hmm. Why why should films be this boring? Why should films be just be telling this story? Like if like when we were studying about script writing, that is that uh, Robin McKee, mm. everything has to be this, this the plot line. You know, right. you have the free plot ads or whatever. It doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Movies can be anything, and it still can be influential, and still can be uh, entertaining, mm-hmm. and uh, and and that movie truly represented that group of people that it wants to represent yes in a way that is very fitting for that group of people and that era yeah so had it been done in any other way in a traditional hollywood way it would mm-hmm. not have worked mm-hmm. so i thought that was a, a crazy movie <laughs> highly recommended <laughs> yeah and i think it's a brilliant tribute to the the people in front of the camera as yeah. well yeah. speaking about that do you think that in the future now that you feel more established um do you feel like you could venture into something that's a little more like out there like funeral parade of roses or something like john watersy like or almodovari that's something that is a little more loud well my first film was very loud actually the first okay. one because that was very influenced by almodovar mm-hmm. uh woman on the verge so yeah. it was it was kind of out there. Oh, it was wow. kind of uh, outrageous. So I, I, I haven't seen it for a long time. So maybe I should rewatch it before I say <laughs> talk much about it. <laughs> but it was very, very different from uh, Sok Sok and All Shall Be Well. And front cover is actually very different because at that mm-hmm. time I really wanted to do a movie kind of like a Hollywood romantic Romance, comedy, yeah. but in a in a way with two Asian guys falling in love with each other mm-hmm. so that was something that i want to do like uh, turn the romantic comedy on his head and yeah. do something uh different about it uh so yes next one uh, i don't know uh i have a few ideas and so i'm still exploring okay yeah. okay we'll yeah. we'll be looking forward to seeing great, it whenever great. it comes okay cool. um before we close it out 
would you want to um, tell our audience when the film is going to be coming out in the U.S.? Uh, I th- the opening is going to be on the 20th of September at Film mm-hmm. Forum in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're very, very happy about that because Film Forum is somewhere that I used to go when I was at Columbia. Yes. Uh, went there to watch a lot of movies and actually uh, learn a lot about uh, movie histories and filmmaking. Yeah. Uh, sitting there in a the dark in the, at the uh, film forum so uh very happy that the movie is going to be there and then uh hopefully it will be shown in um, all the major cities in america great so you can keep an eye out for all shall be well which will be opening on september 20th in the states okay thank you so much for- thank you so much Hope you enjoyed that interview. Thank you so much to Ray Young for giving us the time and also bringing us this incredible film. All Shall Be Well is now playing in theaters in the U.S. and I hope you can catch it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Deep Cut. Please rate and review because that helps us keep making the show and helps others discover the show as well. Be sure to subscribe to us wherever you listen to podcasts so you'll know when our next episode drops. Keep up with Deep Cut on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd at Deep Cut Pod. You can also join us to talk about movies on our Discord server. We now also have a Patreon. If you want to support us, we deeply appreciate it. Click the link in our description or go to deepcutpod.com to find our Patreon, Discord, and all the other socials that we've mentioned here. Deep Cut is hosted and produced by us, Wilson Lai, Benjamin Yap, and Eli Sands. And our cover art is designed by Justina Yam, and our theme song is composed by Eli Sands. I'm Wilson. Take care, and we're looking forward to talking about more movies with you next time. <laughs>